Okay. You draw. And you can let them in whenever you feel like it. All right. Well, it is 1029, so I believe I will admit the ones who are waiting. And then I'll um, hit live on the Facebook. Okay, we're we're go on Facebook, so you can do your thing whenever you're ready. I guess we got 30 seconds left. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, whatever. <laughs> How's everybody doing this morning? Pretty good. Yeah. It's all good. Yeah. Well, we'll be three, two, one, zero pretty soon. <laughs> Sounds like we got a delay somewhere. Um, I think that was just me testing out the Facebook. So we're, sh we should. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, cool. Well, it's now 1030. So we're going to get going. Um, today, we're going to be talking about uh, rote memory versus research and critical thinking. Now, this subject is important because Right now, our school system in South Dakota is debating about how our education programs, particularly history, but how we're we going to teach young people. And when I listen to the debate, it seems to boil down. Uh, of course, there's all that political stuff in there, but it seems to be boiling down to should we be teaching rote memory? In other words, just teach kids a whole bunch of facts. And then later, maybe if, they're, if they survive that, when they get to junior high school or more like high school, then we start teaching them. We introduce some things about critical thinking, some things about research. But as I looked over the plan, it was like, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, there's that research thing, you know, and there's that critical thinking things. But they just mention it, and they don't say, like, okay, well, where is this skill supposed to come from? <clears throat> so uh, there tends to be a, a strong leaning on the rote memory. And people made what they thought were uh, good discussions about that and their arguments pro and con. But I found that it seemed like the people who are making the case, whatever the case is, weren't actually familiar with how memory works, you know, and how it doesn't work. You know, that's one of the interesting things. So I thought it would be an interesting discussion to have looking at how do we think memory works versus how the research shows that it works? Because I think we're still, by and large, back in the 1930s about how we think memory works. So my first question, uh, just to get on the same page, is I would like to have uh, our esteemed panel here talk about what they think Anything you can say about memory? What do you know about memory? Uh, uh, I'm assuming you can remember that, but what can you what can you say about memory? Any anecdote? Well. <laughs> One of the things that comes to my mind is how um, it seems like I often read about or hear about how faulty our memories are, um, mm. how unreliable. And I mean, we all get that with distant past things. I and mean, I'm sure anybody who grew up in a family will, you know, talk about, oh, this happened in my childhood and remember that. And then, you know, your sibling or cousin or somebody will say, well, that's not what I remember. It was so-and-so and not the person you said. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think about what, what they say in terms of eyewitness testimony in, in courts that quite often it very quickly, you know, solidifies in your mind 
to a point where you could think you saw one thing and and it really wasn't exactly what you saw. So, I mean, you know, we all like to think we have good memories, but I think they're a little more influenced by other factors than we would like to think they are. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, that is a very important point to peg in this discussion. Todd, you were going to say something? No, I, I was going to kind of, I agree with you, and mainly because the way that memory works is that you don't really remember an event, you remember the last time you remembered the event. And so, I mean, that's how memory works physiologically. And so it's kind of like making a Xerox copy of a Xerox copy. And as you go over time, the most amazing thing I've ever heard, and it's true because I've had it happen to me at least once in my experience, is that people even adopt other people's memories as their own because they're remembering it, but the person gets transferred somehow to themselves because they've carried it forward long enough that the actual carrier of it, they've confused to their own person. And so they'll remember it happening to them. And I'll say, wait a second, no, no, that's me. The first time I heard, read about that, I said, ah, that's impossible. And then it happened. And I was like, oh my gosh, you know? And then I thought, my God, how many times have I done that to in myself? I mean, I don't know, but it's just like, uh, it's a little discouraging at first, like, wow. <laughs> yeah, what are we if not our memories, you know? <laughs> so anyone else have any observations, Mary? Yeah. Can you hear me? Did I unmute? Yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. You're good. Okay. As a memoir writer, this whole issue of faulty memories is really tricky and um, it can be, it, it can cause problems with the reader. So um, if they think you, you've forgotten something or misinterpreted something or misremembered, then they question the whole story you've told. And I, I'll give just a quick example of that. Um, I was, with my first memoir, I was talking in a library in Marshall, Minnesota, and I was talking about my earliest memory, which was being in the hospital in Chamberlain, South Dakota, and the light coming through the bars, and my mother sitting in the corner, and a woman in the audience, who was a psychologist, said, well, you don't remember any of that, because three-year-olds don't have memories, and I thought, wow, so where did that come from? I mean, I know that some of those memories like my mother yelling at the doctor, you're letting her die, you're letting her die. That's a story I heard, right? I don't remember that, but I remember hearing her tell that story often because I was convulsing. But I can imagine she talked about the light coming through the window and shining through the bars of my hospital crib on the floor. That doesn't seem like anything that I would have been repeated to me. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So where did that come from and you know so in other words I thought well now is she question well she questioned everything she's saying you don't remember this is she going to question everything else she reads in the book um and, and yet did I is that not memory is that something I created as I wrote about it I mean that's the question I have every time I write a memoir am I really remembering or is writing about it creating scenes that really didn't exist, but seemed true to me. And um, another, I'll give you another example. Um, just very quickly, my father was, I had a really complicated, unhappy marriage because my father had just been diagnosed with terminal cancer. He insisted we get married. He got diagnosed on a Monday, my wedding was Saturday. He insisted we get married, although I didn't want to. I had never written about that or talked much about that wedding. So I, when I wrote about it years ago, getting ready for my second memoir, I wrote that my brother, Jim, who walked me down the aisle, then went back and sat down in the pew with my mother. That was my memory for 50 years. And I was about two years away from printing this book when I thought, wait a minute, he sang at my wedding. He didn't sit in the front pew with my mother. He went up in the choir loft and sang with my brother, Terry. So now what did, where did that come from, right? That was a memory I had for 50 years that was false. So then when you read brain science, if it's a very traumatic experience, you will sometimes block out that experience and replace it with something more palatable, something that you can handle. 
And so, you know, I don't know. Memoir writers really struggle with this. Am I telling the truth? And what is the truth? That's the other part of the question. What is the truth? So anyway, that's my two bits. Thank you. That's a, that's a double two bits. <laughs> <laughs> well, whatever. <laughs> Anyone else? Any, any uh, experiences you've had with memory? What do you think about memory? Anything at all you can say about memory? <laughs> Anybody? Well, why are Oh, go ahead, Con. I just want to say one quick thing. Sorry, I hate to butt back in, but I just wanted to say something that's interesting to something to along what Mary was talking about there is that so my family, a lot of people have always said, Man, you have a great memory. And I and the truth is, it, I don't know if it's really a great memory. What happens though as a storyteller and someone who tells stories verbally and writing wise, those stick with you longer even if you don't write them down because you tell them repeatedly doesn't it isn't necessarily a great memory but you do carry something forward and what you find is that people a lot of times if you tell the story away repeatedly adopt that as their memory as well i mean their memory of something a lot of times curves to a Kind of common place and so it's interesting always uh an experience that this is what uh, mary's talking about is that you'll tell a story sometimes and someone is just like well that's certainly not what happened but other people will be you know whoever's in your circle you've told the story they'll have adopted your version whether it's true or not because that is what you carry forward you know if you tell it over and over my kids and i'm sure that every you know parents have this experience all the time I will begin, and I had it when I was a kid, I'll begin to, you know, saying, oh, well, what I, you know, I remember, and my kids will, eyes will roll back into their heads because it is the hundredth time they'll say, which, you know, I'm not even disputing necessarily that I've told the same story. But the thing is that becomes the history of it, that becomes other people's memories. And even people who are there will adopt that because they're, you know, they may not have a, a clear memory of it, whether it's true or not. That becomes part of their memory as well. I just always find that fascinating as someone who tells a lot of stories that, you know, people tend to bend toward the people who flap their lips a lot. <laughs> well, my brother Kevin is a good storyteller. And years ago, he had apparently had been telling his children the story of his buddy, Teddy, who was a Vietnam veteran. And I think Casey was maybe, his son Casey was maybe five or so. And he said to me, well, when Teddy and I were in Vietnam, <laughs> right? So that story was so convincing that all of it, Casey found himself in Vietnam. Well, of course he wasn't, right? But, you know, that's what you're saying, right, Todd? That you can make a memory, a story so compelling, it becomes a part of a person's memory when it's there. Absolutely. And also, also and the person telling the story is saying, Teddy and I, so yeah, your five -year -old, exactly, it's Teddy exactly, and I. <laughs> exactly, Teddy and I. <laughs> that is the story. <laughs> yeah, there is the story. Todd, you were going to say something? No, I, I agree wholeheartedly. I mean, I really, it, that's that's my experience, you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Good. Anyone else have any anecdotes, observations about memory? That's important to us, you know, I mean, to to humanity. Any any anecdotes, things you can think of that you know one should mention when you're talking about memory? Well, I wonder if somebody would want to comment on what we mean by institutional memory, because you're hearing a lot of conversations about that. And how do you read institutional memory? What's your interpretation of that? And why is that an important part mm -hmm. of our culture? Yeah, okay. Anybody? Anybody? <laughs> Well, keep thinking about it, but in the interest of time, I'm going to throw out some anecdotes about memory, because I think these are some of the things that are important to remember when we think about 
relying on memory, particularly rote memory, for teaching and having that the major part of the educational experience. In other words, what do you remember? And judging the, the value of the education by the quantity of things remembered. Because rote memory is not about really quality. It's really about quantity. How many things do you remember? And, and I should underscore here that one of the reasons we do that is because we're kind of seems to we seem to be hardwired to value measurables you know things that we can measure out right and so quantity is one of those things that we can create measurables you know there are 50 states in the union how many can you remember there are x number of presidents you know how many can you remember can you remember their names you know we can measure that so that becomes a way in which we can have an, in, in air quotes, objective measurable about how effective our teaching is. But there are some things to know about um, memory that may cause us to rethink that. For example, Memory is remembering, okay? That's an important concept. In other words, every time you remember something, there are these bits and pieces in your head that come back to assemble the story or to assemble the object. And there are times when some pieces come together that the next time those all those pieces don't come together. And if they do, they come together in a different space. Someone mentioned before about, you know, getting memories that from other people, you know, it's important to think about how you code the information in the first place. And there are lots of things that happen within an event that your brain doesn't even pay attention to. But the problem for the brain is that if there's a gap, some gaps the brain needs to fill in just to make the other gaps make sense. So what happens is we the brain wants to fill in those parts so that the story is contiguous. That's where you have that kind of a weak link. And then the story gets weak. Now, to show how well this works, or not works, <laughs> uh, we have cases where interrogators will implant false memories in a suspect. They will tell a story and let's say the, the suspect was in the vicinity, maybe even in the same room. And there is an unexplained event that caused something, something to go missing or somebody to die or get hurt or something. And the interrogator will say something like, well, we have evidence that such and such happened. We have this other dance and we have this other person who says that's the way it happens. And depending on the suspect, it's very common for the suspect to eventually adapt the story of the interrogator. And this is a very common thing and used to be uh, in air quotes, accepted police practice, right? When someone called that into attention, implanted memories, now it's more suspect. It's supposed to be outlawed, but we find it's still happening. Um, and sometimes the interrogators don't know the difference or they don't know about this or they don't know about the morality or the ethics of that. You know, that's poor training. But the fact is, that it's important to remember that those implants can be made. Now, getting back to the part of how we encode, most children in this country have been taught the pledge to the flag. 
And you would think if there's anything that you have wrote memorized, it would be the pledge to the flag. But it's interesting that when you ask children in the sixth, seventh, eighth grade after they've been practicing this for like six or seven years to write it down, write down from memory, the pledge to the flag, amazing the things. They never heard it right in the first place. It never encoded that, words never encoded. We're not talking about meaning, value, or anything like that, just the words. They never got it right, right? Or you'll have something like the you know, national anthem and people will say things like, if you ask them or just listen to them, they'll say, oh, say, can you see any red bugs on me? If you do take a few, take them home and make stew. You know, it's like, that's because for them, that's what they heard people saying and they're just going along with it. They never got the words, you know? Now, then you think, okay, well, what, can you gain if memory is so weak? Taking into consideration what others have said about its being, you know, like over time you get the story wrong. And these are the stories that people, you know, like Mary and, and uh, uh, Jennifer and Todd were talking about, those stories are personal stories. Things that, you know, you would think you have an emotional attachment to. And the other thing that's important to remember about memory is that it tends to be strongest when there's an emotional attachment to it. In other words, when you have skin in the game, the brain tends to say, oh, that's important. So when you go to sleep at night and the brain is saying, you know, there's a lot of things happen today. Things are even subliminal. We don't really need all of that because now we get so much information that it's hard to, to sort of weed through it. Throw all of that out, right? So it dumps a lot of things. I'm sure, I'm going to guess anyway, that most of you have had the, the, the experience of knowing something when you went to sleep, but not knowing it when you woke up, you know, just some go somewhere, but it ain't there no more, you know. So, uh, uh, you know, if you take all of that into consideration, one has to wonder how valuable rote memory is because if one you're you know getting it straight in the first place is is a challenge two remembering it for the next test is important and then remembering it as a lifelong understanding like people will say oh you should have learned that in the 10th grade yeah but i was out of the 10th grade 40 years ago you know it's like like what do you remember that happened 40 years ago like you're going to remember all of that stuff right so in terms of long-term use and you know utilization it comes down to if you even if you remember it if you don't use it you lose it you know that's just the way it is and also, I think Todd brought up something about uh, narratives and linkages. If you have something that you remember and you can put it into a narrative, a linkage, the brain tends to be able to make sense of that and hold on to linkages more than facts here, there, jumping around. It just, you know, uh, just doesn't happen. One more important thing to remember about memory. There's lots of things, but I'm just going to give you one more. Uh, the, the capacity for memory. Most of you are uh, familiar with uh, telephone numbers. And, and okay, so now people have them on their phone. And I have, you know, I try to use the phone too. <clears throat> because when telephones, I'm, I go way back. And there was a time when, you know, uh, telephones, had four numbers and a prefix, sometimes two, the, four numbers, then two numbers and a prefix, then three numbers and the four numbers. And it was determined for a long time, it was the seven numbers. And the reason was because after some testing, they realized that the, 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 number, the number of numbers that people can most likely familiar was seven. After seven, if you gave them eight, all the other seven got jumbled. It wasn't that they didn't remember the eight. It's just like now the brain has a hard time holding on to the eight. 
Now you see we have added three and now we have the country code. So we now have 11 numbers to remember where the research already told us that we can't remember that. Most people can't. Many people have trouble remembering their own telephone number, let alone the telephone numbers of other people. Now, if you're going to remember history classes, et cetera, and you think, well, I got, let's say 10 friends, how many of them do you know their telephone number by heart? Especially if you don't call them with some kind of regularity, okay? So it calls into question how useful memory is in a practical sense. That is why books are so important because for a long time, you, you take something like as important as people feel the gospels are and people misremembered the gospels. If you go back and look at the history of the Bible, you will see how much, you know, in the putting together of the Bible, how much of the Bible, which came a lot from memory or people had to go back and say, well, this doesn't this doesn't match with this scripture, and this doesn't match with these scrolls that we found, and this doesn't match with this or that. So something's off here, right? So, and then adjustments were made, okay? So if you think of like something that's so important, we had to sort of figure out, well, we're going to have to come to some kind of place where we can, everybody can be on the same page, because we give a sermon, and you have 30 people, and you have 45 different re recollections of what the sermon was about, if they remember it at all. And that's a thing too. Go to a sermon after, you know, go talk to people after you have the sermon, you have coffee, and then ask people after coffee, what was the sermon about, let alone what did the guy say, and see how many people, you know. So let's just say I'm weak on memory, you know, because I don't trust it. You know, I don't trust that whatever the teacher teaches will be accessible when the student becomes an adult and now has to remember, needs to remember those things. Okay, comments. <laughs> well, go ahead, Todd. Yeah. So, talking about the importance of memory, uh, one thing I there was a book that I read I don't know, maybe a year or two ago about a guy who wanted to write a book on the the people who are the best in the world at mem you know the memory contest. I don't know if you're familiar with them, but, mm -hmm. and while he was doing it, he started practicing it. It's that whole memory palace thing. Sure. And he, and he became the U S champion. <laughs> I mean, it was really interesting on in that sense, but one thing that he talked about, I mean, there is a value to, to uh, memory, but I think part of our problem is like you said, it's always in the uh, uh, quantification of it. Yeah. And, he, and in the book, he brought up this thing about the people who have this uh, condition, and you've seen them probably on TV where they don't forget anything. Oh, yeah. They remember, you can ask them anything in their entire life, when a certain day was, you know, you give them a date, and it's not even autism, they, they can, like, they literally are able to pull it back and go, oh, I was, I ate this that morning or whatever. I mean, and it's even hard to kind of Fathom that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When I had seen these interviews on television, I always said, oh, that's, that'd be awesome. That'd be great to have this memory, you know, that you could pull back at any moment, everything you've ever learned. Mm. But when you, but in the context of the book, and he went into it, is that it, it is like one of the worst curses a person can have because the value of it becomes, you know, largely nullified when you can't figure out what's important and what isn't. And as you said, you know, when you're tied to something, you remember it better. But if if the only, you know, once that tie gets broken or gets weaker, its value obviously is less. And so if you're, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, you know, and I've always thought about this as my own learning experience, 
is there's a lot of things I probably should have remembered that I didn't. But my engagement with it wasn't, you know, the value wasn't there yet. Mm. It may be coming 10 years too late or something, or maybe I had it and then I just, you know, and just like you talked about, there's stuff you you let go, you may hold on for 20 years. And then when you no longer need it, you can usually let it go. There's a few things though, like telephone numbers. There's almost anybody can, I mean, I can remember my telephone number from when I was five years old. So you know, some of those things stick because of use mm -hmm. and it was very important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's stuck in that place. But when you're teaching things, you know, when you go in to try to teach something, say this is very important, you must remember it, is probably one of the worst ways to get somebody to remember something because the value is like you're telling me it. I mean, you know, what do you, even if you're wrapping my knuckles saying I have to remember it, it's, you know, it will probably create a strong memory for a short time because of the emotional context, but it will fall apart so much more rapidly. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you teach something that you feel value of knowing or trying to learn or something, those things tend to stick with you or probably most importantly that you can use repeatedly. Mm -hmm. And this is why, you know, I always feel like, yeah, I, there's things I should remember, but realistically, if I could just remember why I'm supposed to remember it, it'd probably be better. <laughs> that makes any sense but yeah sure well if i were to tell a story and i will about that connects with what you just said when i was oh quite young you know just before going to uh, uh grammar school my mother always complained that my memory was like you know she said boy you can't remember anything you you'd forget your hat if it wasn't on your head you know and then so one day she said, okay, she sent me to the grocery store and she said, okay, look, I'm going to tie this string on your finger. And when you get to the grocery store, you look at this string and you remember that you're supposed to get, let's say for, for story, four items, okay? So I had to walk to the store and it was a good little ways. So I'm walking to the store and by the time I got to my, I guess about halfway there, I'm looking at this string and say, what the heck is this string about? I take it off and I throw the string off. <laughs> then I get to the store and I get to the store and I say, oh, the string was supposed to remind me of the thing, but I couldn't remember what the things were because I didn't have the string. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's a funny thing about memory and it's only since I've been like paying attention to it and paying attention to, what kind of things I remember that I started to really grow a distrust of memory, you know? And I should mention, Todd, that the interesting thing is, you know, you mentioned this, you know, this technique for memory that people have that they say, okay, look, if you want to remember things, do this and create. Show me the school where you that you're teaching things by road memory that they teach that technique. It's almost like they want you to forget things. They're not making. A, they're just thinking. Well, if I tell you, you'll remember. You you think if you go through teaching school, did someone tell you it doesn't? You know, I'm not saying it's the, the, the teacher's fault. It's the people who are teaching the teachers, and they set up a curriculum. Because nowhere in that curriculum did I see focus on how to remember, right? Technique of how to remember, you know? Uh, here's this practice will give a better result in the students remembering this stuff because we're depending. What if you're not, if that's what you're going to school is to remember all these facts and at the end you don't remember the facts, you know? if. If one year later out of high school, you can't give the same test you gave from one to 12, one through 12, and have kids score, you know, in the high 70s anyway on it, then what was all that time about? What was all that time you spent in, the, in, the, in this school? Mary? Well, that's a really good question. And there's another, but there's another side to this. Um, I taught writing at the college level for 30 years. And... I had students who knew grammar rules. They knew structure of sentences. They knew how to research. They were impeccable researchers, but they could not step outside of the box and do any kind of analytical thinking because they had memorized all they needed to write, but they hadn't learned 
how to take that and now start thinking outside of beyond memorization, but what do I do with this information? What does this mean? Um, what do I want the reader to know? Or what do I need to know? So it, memorization is not always thinking. There's, you need both, right? Uh, you can memorize, but you still have to be able to analyze and reflect and do some thinking on it. So, and that I think is harder to teach than memorization, yes. but that's just me. <laughs> it, it may be, it may be harder, but I think it's at least as an important, if not more important. And I think we're not investigating it enough. Yeah. You know, I think what you're what you're talking about, Mary, is contextual thinking, mm -hmm. right? And having a putting putting the 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 um, information that you memorize in context, which gets back to something Todd was saying about how. If you link it to something, if it means something in a context, you'll have a better chance of remembering the thing. Okay. Well, if you're right about something, you have a better chance of remembering it. But but what I'm talking that, about true. is they yeah. might um, they they could research and they could put blocks of direct quotes and link them together perfectly and and um, document them perfectly but not reflect on what those quotes meant, not try to make sense of what the quotes, and then they would be very frustrated with me if they didn't get A pluses because they did everything right, but tell us what, what it meant. Yeah. They, could, they could regurgitate, but they couldn't say, but this is what this means or could mean or should mean. I mean, so it's a combination of both. You're absolutely right. And I guess the other question, and then I'm going to shut up, with all the information we need in the palm of our hands today, I mean, you and I had to go to the library and check out our book or right, or go to, a, if your parents had encyclopedias. Now, it's, we are five seconds away from answers in some cases. So does that increase or decrease the necessity for memorization? The fact that it's information is so accessible. I don't know. I, I am not smart enough to solve these problems. <laughs> yeah. Well, you may be surprised you know, I'm you're, smart? As smart no, as every, I won't be. you're as smart as the rest of us, you know, but <laughs> I, I, I think it's it's worth pointing out that when writing was becoming popular, many philosophers complained that writing would deteriorate memory, okay? So it's always new technologies always challenge and threaten the, the people who are using the old technologies because they've they have a lot of skin in the old technology game, you know, yeah. the way things were done. They have spent a lifetime, you know, honing that skill and their self-esteem is connected to that skill. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes along and say that's an obsolete skill, that person feels tremendously devalued. So they almost have a knee jerk uh, need to to keep that old thing in place otherwise yeah. they're put out to pasture yeah okay yeah that i i get that i understand yeah. so that brings us really to the other half of this and that is looking at a, another alternative to just rote memory not to say especially not to say that we're throwing a, away memory remembering anything you right. know and i mean that would it has a lot of problems too. Yes, but as yes, you yes. mentioned, Mary, we now have access to a lot more information. And it's very important to point out there is a lot more information, mm -hmm. right? If you go back, you know, the, the, the amount of available information grows exponentially. That means not one and one, but one, two, four, 16, you know, 32, 64, 128, and suddenly, and count those as billions, okay? All of those data bits are out there. And so what I had to remember in college, a sixth grader now has to remember, otherwise they're non-competitive. Right, right, hence right. your <laughs> So if you have this gross amount of new information that you have to remember, we're asking that child to do a lot more than we ever had to do. Yeah. And if that child only remembers what we remember, what we remember, they're done. Yeah. You know, stick a fork in them. They're they are non-competitive, competitive yeah. in today's world. So the question is, how do we access information 
other than memory. Yeah, and the other thing I'll say about access to all this information is there's also too much misinformation and getting students to helping students understand not everything on the internet is true <laughs> or is factual. So, you know, we have to learn how to sort through. And I think that's what you're talking about in a way. Exactly. You sort through all that information and know which is right, which is as close to truth as possible and which is, you know. Right. You know. Well, it's also important to mention that everything on the internet is not untrue. Exactly. Exactly. You know, because a lot exactly. of people translate, well, everything on the internet is not true to nothing's on the internet right. is exactly. true. Right. That's probably more problematic, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we if we look at even if you're not the 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 internet, you know, I you can go back to encyclopedias. Yep. Yep. And yep. what 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 wasn't said and isn't said when people talk about the internet is how much information in the encyclopedia that was wrong. Right. You know, right. it's just flat out wrong. Right. And how much stuff that they learned in school that you had to memorize, like George Washington chopped down the cherry right. tree right. And, yes. and he never told a lie. Right. What? <laughs> you know, <it's> like, right. <laughs> why did you even have to say that? You know, mm -hmm. but you were in, in my first grade, that was on their test you know, as a first grader. So they were trying to implant wow. that in the test. So the question is now, if I look for solutions, juxtapose is research and something you're pointing to, Mary, critical thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, how do, what are the guidelines or what are the, the, the litmus tests that we use? Not so much for, for me for what is true but what can i reasonably believe as fact mm -hmm. right or what can right. i take as look this is going to be a working fact until i find out something is different right right, right? And be able to recalculate right. kind of like your you know those those gps things that you use to find your way in the car right. and then if you make a turn off they say recalculating <laughs> 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 because hey, you, you took a wrong turn here, recalculating, I'm going to tell you how to get back on track, you know? So how do you install those kind of things yeah. in the learning experience? Any Anybody have have any comments on how, how you think that might happen? Well, this is the sound I hear from the Board of Education, you know, on this subject. You know? <laughs> it's like, huh? <laughs> I don't, we don't know. But they're discussing it and they're trying to suppose, uh, given the benefit of the doubt, they're trying to come up with a reasonable solution. Okay. So I think when I went to the hearings, what I wasn't hearing was a consideration <laughs> of these things. You know, like, for example, if you start teaching students research skills, the moment they come into at least first grade, mm -hmm. you know, maybe kindergarten. So research skill doesn't mean go to the library and pull out, you know, the, the Declaration of Independence. That's at, at the first grade, right? Mm -hmm. Research skills can be, I put an object in X, in X number of places, how would you find that object? How would you go about finding the object? You know, um, what are your senses? How do you use your senses to find things? How do you, observation, throw five different objects on the table, take the objects off and say, what did you see, right? Put an object on the table and say, what do you see? Put a picture in front of students and say, what do you see in this picture? What do you think is happening in this picture? And have other people comment. Now, I mean, there's a whole bunch of techniques or, or experiences young people can have that teach them to say, hmm, what is that? And to be okay with, you know, when the first time I saw that, I thought I saw this. But now that I look at it, right. I see this. Right, right. 
So if you went to the hearings, Lawrence, did you see that kind of interest in teaching students at a young age, that kind of research? research? Absolutely. Did you walk not, even, not even in the 12th grade. It wasn't there. Okay. 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 It okay. just wasn't there. Okay. Yeah, they, they basically, they paid in there, and I read through their whole mm -hmm. manifesto, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't, you know, they kind of played lip service to critical thinking, but they didn't show any, they didn't show any, uh, let's say, game plan for developing critical thinking skills. And I have had teachers tell me, oh, I teach critical thinking in my class in the 10th grade, 11th grade, or 12th grade. I've had teachers who are teaching tell me that. And I say, well, it's interesting because I know some of your students and they have no clue. But but let me let me go back and ask you, did you cover uh, logical fallacies? No. Well, that's too complicated. No, it isn't. <laughs> what do you mean it's too complicated? You know, just because if you study logical fallacies, it gets back to what you're saying, Mary. It's like, well, how do you do it? Put it in context. You think, okay, when you tell me this thing, there's this thing missing, or you're trying to influence me by these kinds of words or saying that this person said it, but well, that doesn't make it true just because that person said it. You know, right. having right. those kind of understandings. How do you, how do you learn to? Do you teach your children the scientific method, right? For not just in the chemistry class, in life. Are you showing them the scientific method? Are they determining, are they making life decisions, especially important ones, based on a scientific method? Because some people think that that's just about chemistry and biology or, you know, rocket science or something. No, it's everyday living. That's the value. And if you can put that as just normalize it, it seems to me that you, since we, I think we agree that you're not going to remember everything that the teacher said. Right. But if there's a reliable place that you can go, that you can find what the teacher at least should have said, because this is a consensus of observations of many people from different points of views, like a Wikipedia, you know, you might argue that, hey, there was this thing I found in Wikipedia that was wrong. But you'll find more a lot more that was right than you're going to find wrong. Plus, you have all of the footnotes to say, where did this person get that opinion? And you can go check it out. You can't do that on the fly in your 12th grade history class. Okay. <clears throat> right. Yeah. So if you can teach a child, from my opinion, if you can teach a child how to learn, how to teach themselves, how to find information, how to vet information, and have them in, incorporate that into their daily lives starting at kindergarten, you know, at the level in which a child has an, a question, it's the level at which, as adults, we should be helping them to find answers, whatever those questions are. And when we don't know, or when it's unknowable, be able to say, I really don't know. This is a difficult question. What do you think? Work on that problem. And then come <laughs> back and tell me, and then I'll challenge that, your, mm -hmm. your answer. Mm -hmm. You know? To me, that seems, that seems a reasonable approach, but then maybe that's why they didn't elect me, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tough right now in education. Yeah. Lawrence, can I share uh, sure. just a, a comment from, from Darcy on Facebook as I put it in the chat here, but just in talking about trying to balance that, you know, what do you really need to know with rote memory versus what we would consider the higher order thinking skills, like the critical thinking and the usage and the, the implementation that we're talking about. And she says, I can attest to math concepts while trying to help my kids with schoolwork. Rote memory is a must for things like multiplication facts, in my opinion. There have been so many struggling children trying to learn math multiplication concepts using blocks and rows and units, etc. I feel my kids have messed out, missed out on a lot of necessary memorization that I, as a parent, have had to work on at home. I understand the critical thinking outside the box, but it's difficult for many. 
And I, I think that gets to kind of the core of some of this is that there are certain things that we kind of have to memorize at mm -hmm. some point. I mean, I when I think about things that I memorize sometime and still remember, the multiplication tables are one of them. And I that's not necessarily useful for its own sake, but it's useful to use as the problems keep getting more and more complicated. And so that's a thing you can just go back to and, and say, oh yeah, I remember what five times six is. And so I just automatically put it in while I'm trying to figure out this complicated algebra problem that's, you know, it's, is a little bit more, um, more difficult. So, so yeah, well, it, it, I'm always trying to figure out where, what is important to have rote mm -hmm. memory and maybe it's the building blocks. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the important things, and I'm glad you brought that up because I can't see Facebook, but that is a very important thing. One of the things that we that we struggle with is I learned this way. If I'm going to help my child and my child learns in a different way, even though if they're in the second or third grade, I can feel stupid because I can't I can't wrap my head around it. And so I can't help my child to understand it. What's interesting about the math problem and the math concept that that uh, I, I forgot what, what Darcy did you say it pointed out, and it's an important consideration. I, I don't feel like I'm downplaying it at all. But one of the things is, after I got much older and graduated from high school, somebody uh, uh, introduced me to doing math in my head. Before that, it was all on paper. And I learned the old paper way. There are kids in India who learn a way that they figure stuff out on their fingers. That's that they can do. They can solve math problems faster than the kids with computers, with 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 calculators. They do it in their head, no paper, and they just do it in their head. You go look up on the on YouTube and put in like finger math or something like that, and you'll see these kids performing. You know, the, as fast as the teacher can give them the numbers, six times seven times 128 times 2,580, they got the answers in their head, accurate, okay? So do they memorize uh, math, uh, timetables? I don't think so. Because what they do is they start to understand concept and how to shift things around, like in an abacus. But essentially, they're doing the abacus on their fingers, with their fingers, right? And so for those children, they understand what is happening when you say five times six, right? They understand it's just not some magical thing that's that's a memory thing that we just, it's not a convention that five times six is 30. There's something that creates five times six is 30. So then it, even if it's harder in the beginning to like wrap your head around it, usually it's just, it's harder for parents to teach that or help the students. But even if it's harder, they get a lot more benefit out of it because when they have to go into, let's say how computers work on the base two instead of the base 10, then the student can understand that. They're going to be working with computers. They're not going to be doing the base 10. They don't do the base 10 now because they're working with computers. If you're going to code or understand the code, and right now you can say, well, I, I, we can get along just fine without code. Eh, you can now, but your kids won't be able to, you know, because that's such, that is going to be, an actual fact, other kids in other places are learning different kinds of math. We're trying to catch up to those kids, right? Just like we in Liberia and North Korea are the only ones that use the empirical measuring system, right? We're not using metric. Everywhere else is using metric system, you know? Which by the way is the base 10, but it's all relative to something else. It's based on something. So I guess I'm saying like, okay, yeah, it may seem like your child should be, there. there's some things, as I said in the beginning of this conversation, I'm not saying we shouldn't remember anything. It's not that kind of, how to say straw man, you know, extreme. It's not that. 
it's really that, okay, where we put the emphasis. And if we say, look, it's not enough to learn that five times six is 30. It's not enough to, under, to, to, to know that. It's important to understand what that means, right? And how it's useful in some other, and how it's relative to four times six and how you can get there. Because I have now a book called Math Tricks, okay? I, I bought it because I wanted to bring, and I did bring a copy into the prison, okay? For guys who are like struggling. Because the way we teach math is obtuse, meaning that it's, it, that's the complicated thing. So these math tricks teach you to do, this. you can find this, these, there's a number of people who write these kind of books where they allow you to see numbers in a different way. So, you know, we didn't learn the Rose method, you know, nobody, well, actually I can say that I did have a teacher that showed me that, right? But most kids don't get that. My parents had nothing to do with it, you know, because if I did, they, they would just have me memorize things, okay? Um, they have me memorize all kinds of stuff, most of which I have forgotten. And most of which, if you go back to the timetables now, and, the, and one of the reasons that our children have such a hard time with math, or our people, adults, have a hard time with math is because they memorized the timetables, they forgot the timetables, now they can't do anything. That's the problem, you know? It's not just like, can they pass the test? So, I mean, if you wanna see the efficacy of that, pick a random adult and give them a timetables test. <laughs> <laughs> and see, you know. So it's not just what you learn, it's like what you remember. It's taught. You know, the thing, I mean, you're really coming down to, you know, a value judgment, right? On, mm -hmm. on how much you should put. I mean, there's going to be something for memorization, something for critical thinking. There's two things, though, I think that, you know, it's really about the discussion about it. Mm. One thing that it would be important to do, I would think is look at a case study where memorization has been the primary form of education in the modern world. Because I live in one of those places and they're dealing with the, the consequence of it and trying to rectify that as fast as they can. They have entire, lost pretty much 20 years of people to a system that dedicated almost solely to memorization. And they're paying for it but they're rapidly trying to catch up. And so they're dealing with a lot of these struggles of saying, we have to get people into this other form of thinking. And it is amazingly like across the board. It isn't just, you know, STEM. STEM is very important in this, but it's across the board. And I think also one thing as far as like, you know, how we react as adults, because I deal with this, you know, my kids, one's a, a chem major and the other one's a music major. So I get to see it on all sides of that realm. Like, how does the modern world? One thing, Thomas Friedman wrote a book called uh, Thank You for Being Late, which was supposed to be a follow-up to The World is Flat. The World is Flat is about what you're talking about, information available at all times, so much that it has changed the way that we think and live. Mm -hmm. Thank You for Being Late is a separate book that he had meant to just update the first book. Mm -hmm. But in the three years between the two books, he found that acceleration had moved to such a great level that it is now a completely different discussion than it was just the three years prior, that more had changed between 2014 and 2017 than had between 2014 and the American Revolution. Exactly. So when you make this discussion about memorization, the real question is, so what are you going to ask people to memorize? Yeah. Because it's moving so fast. That if you don't give them skills to, you know, critically think, what they're memorizing will be ancient history before they get out of the school system in which they are in. Okay. And that's always been an interesting, you know, the thing is like, so what is the end result of that? <laughs> you know, we like to think of it because it makes us feel good to think, oh, well, it was this way when I learned. And I, and I get that completely. Mm -hmm. But this is not that time. That's right. You know, and so I, I just, you know, I always get to that when people start talking about, 
well, when, you know, education, people need to know more stuff and more certainly when their time, it's like, well, they had to need, need to know that stuff. But this is not that time. Right. I will say, Todd, that I used to be a big one on, let's get more information. How can we get more information? Even if you go to how can I access more information, like on my tablet. And now I realize, oh, our security agencies have problem that they have so much information that they can't do anything. They're paralyzed with information. So we're going to have to learn a different way of dealing with the information that we have. And I don't think we can start with a grad at the graduate level in college teaching that. It doesn't happen. We'll have to revamp our education system so that children can, let's say, uh, enlarge the prefrontal cortex, you know, we're gonna have to have some you know, new structures maybe, but certainly we're gonna have to be able to maximize the synapses that we have. Well, <laughs> we're coming up on the end of, of our discussion to be continued, you know, but uh, we, there's a lot in this conversation. And I hope that those of you who have joined uh, have gotten some different ways to think, even if they're not convincing, it's like there's some new things to put in the mix. Um, yeah. So with that, we'll see you next week on a brand new show. Same time, same station. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone.